As we get started today, we are in a series on the family between Mother's Day and Father's Day, and we're looking at the uh, discipling children today. We looked at that last week, and we'll look at it again today. And then after that, we'll spend a couple weeks on marriage, the husband and wife role, uh, as laid out in Scripture, and then a challenge to fathers for Father's Day. And so uh, we look forward to that. But, you know, life is full of problems and stressors. Life is full of things that really kind of rub us the wrong way, isn't it? And as parents, we get to navigate with our kids lots of problems. Uh, and I just want to share with you something that happened to me this past week. I was, with a, I was with a couple, and we were out to dinner. They were a married couple. And we were talking, and throughout the course of their conversation, they related something that that was a problem that they ran into this past week. Uh, the, the wife that was there with us at the table, uh, she is in charge of the finances. And uh, she usually puts all the, the money in the checking account to pay bills and moves everything extra to the savings account. And he said, uh, because of a miscalculation of my wife, uh, we were actually overdrawn and had to pay the bank an overdraft fee which he was really annoyed by. And then he made this comment. I couldn't believe it. He said, I don't know how God could make someone so pretty and yet so stupid at the same time. That was my reaction. Uh, To which, without dropping a beat, the wife said, God made me pretty so you would fall in love with me, and God made me stupid so I would fall in love with you. (laughs) That didn't actually happen. But uh, our... Our lives, our parenting, our marriage, our relationships with our kids, our kids' relationships with each other is full of problems and it's full of stressors. And there's all sorts of things that, that rub us the wrong way and God uses those things for his glory. And one thing that I've realized in preparing for this message and preparing for this sermon series is that wherever you are, whoever you are, God has placed you in your family for the purpose of your personal holiness. God has placed you in your family and is going to use your family and use the problems that come with that family for the purpose of your personal holiness. This is just how God works. God uses the world around us to grow us and to teach us. We live in a problem-full world. We live in a sin-cursed world. So there is time after time where we run into all sorts of problems. We have problems not being able to relate to one another. Husbands and wives have problems. Dads and sons, moms and daughters, siblings have problems in relating to one another. One day, God is going to put everything back again how it's supposed to be. One day, our hope is, the hope that we rest on is that we will be like Christ. And one day, God is going to set those hearts, those relationships, right again. Malachi 4, 5, and 6 allude to this. This is within the context of Israel. But he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. But what's it implying there in verse 6? It implies that hearts are not in tune with one another. Hearts of children aren't the same as the hearts of parents. One day God's going to fix this. Again, this is within the context of Israel. But one day we're going to see Jesus. We're going to be with him. And God is going to make perfect our relationships again. And that is a beautiful hope that we have to look forward to. God's plan is to intervene for relationships and intervene in hearts. And he does this in the context of the family unit by using the parents to disciple their children. He uses parents to disciple their children. But in order to do that, we have to understand where our kids' hearts tend to be. 
uh, Chap Bettis, the author of Disciple Making Parents, puts it this way. He says, to realize our child's need for the gospel, we must start by realizing his true state. The Bible makes it clear that my little bundle of joy, the light of my life, is both made in the image of God and filled with the rebellious heart. He is given a special advantage of being born into a family that names the name of God, but he is also born with a heart bent towards evil. Left uncorrected, the trajectory of that will take him away from God. He is a sinner by birth and by choice. Scriptures say he is born in these conditions, dead in trespasses and sin, by nature under God's wrath with a heart that loves darkness and hates light, with a heart that is inclined to evil from childhood and on the road to destruction and hell. J.C. Riley elaborates with the following. He says, The fairest child who has entered life this year and become the sunbeam of the family is not, as his mother perhaps fondly calls him, a little angel or a little innocent, but is a sinner. As that infant boy or girl lies smiling and crowing in its cradle, that little creature carries in its heart the seeds of every kind of wickedness. Only watch it carefully as it grows in stature and its mind develops, and you will soon detect in it an incessant tendency to that which is bad and a backwardness to that which is good. The first cause of all sin lies in the natural corruption of the boy's own heart and not in public schools. I really like that because we tend to blame all our problems on society or environment or the schools or whatever it might be, but the true enemy of their heart is inside them, right? The true enemy that's going to lead them astray is their own mind, their own heart. And so I want to look at what the Bible says uh, about the, the nature of our children. And, and by the way, if you're not a parent with kids in the home today, this is still very relevant to you because you are influential on other kids, right? Right? There's no one who's influential on zero kids. And besides that, this is just sort of the basics of discipling people. And if you're a Christian, if you're a disciple of Christ, then your goal, your purpose, your ministry is to disciple other people, to lead people to Christ and to teach them scriptures. That's the Great Commission. So a lot of this, even though we're talking about parents and, and children relationships, really applies to everybody who claims uh, the name of Christ. This description that we just read is uh, very biblical. The Bible says these things. Uh, the Bible says very clearly that your child, your bundle of joy, your little angel, is by nature a child of wrath if he, that is without Christ. Ephesians 2 up on the screen says, and you he made alive who are dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Verse 3 implies that be, we're children of wrath because we long to fulfill the desires of the flesh, the desires of the mind. There's nobody that's outside of that. There's nobody that's not a sinner. This is why Christ died on the cross to set us free from this power, but it is a powerful sin nature that dwells inside hearts. We are by nature, children of wrath. That means their very nature. They, they exist and they sin. It's natural. You don't have to teach a child to sin, do you? You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to want its desires fulfilled. It's natural. And as they get older, the, the more sinful the desires, uh, by nature... Just naturally, without Christ's intervention, they're children of wrath. 
John 3, 19 through 20 says, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But men love darkness. We love sin. And if we're totally honest, parents, this is us. We are constantly fighting the war against the flesh, the war against sin. And your little bundle of joy is as well, aren't they? It's fundamentally important that we understand on a foundational level that our children are deeply vulnerable to the power of indwelling sin. They love darkness. Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. This God said after the flood. But what does he say about the nature of people in that verse? It says, uh, from their youth, the imagination of their hearts is evil. They are prone to evil. We are evil beings separated from God. And without Christ, this is how we are. Christ sets us free from that. You know, it's really interesting as a parent because when, they're, when your child is little, like three or four years old, you can just like get adamant and they'll change their ways. You can just be like, no, don't do that, right? You wave your hands, make a big scene. No, don't do that. And then what will happen? The child will cry. Oh, sorry, mom. I didn't mean to disappoint you. Sorry, dad. I didn't mean to mess up. Don't you wish your teenagers uh, responded like that? You just be like, no, don't do that. You're like, oh, sorry. But when they get older, what's their attitude? No, don't do that. Oh, well, you know, maybe I could do that. Dad, have you considered this? Or have you considered this? And they have intricate ways of justifying sins, right? Uh, when they're little, you can just get adamant and tell them, no, don't do that. And they'll get scared. They'll get taken aback. When they get older, you have to interact with their heart. When they get older, you have to interact with their heart. Your kids need Christ, and they need you your discipleship, your ministry, and their life. Uh, if you have kids at home, this is your first ministry. Last week we talked about accepting this responsibility of discipling your children, not leaving it to chance. And by accepting it, I mean embracing the problems and headaches that come with discipling your kids. And you do that because they're worth it. Uh, they're worth it because Jesus is worth it. But it starts with taking responsibility for the discipleship of your kids. That's going to mean that your heart's going to have to get right. You're going to have to be a good example. Uh, you're going to have to change some of your ways. And, that, and those are, there's problems that we have to take on when we choose to disciple somebody, even our kids. But those problems, those headaches are very much worth it because the kid is worth it because Christ is worth it. We also talked last week about how the goal of parenting isn't to have perfect kids or to have perfectly behaved kids. The goal of parenting ultimately is your personal obedience to Christ and discipling your kids to know the scriptures and then become convinced of them and convinced of living Christ's life for themselves, their walk with the Lord. We took this from 2 Timothy chapter 3, so this is just a bit of review from last week. 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is writing about Timothy, about his upbringing, and he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know from those from whom you have learned it. So what he's saying is those that he learned it from were good examples to him. This is talking about his mother who was a Jewish believing woman, a, a Christian woman. And it says, you have learned and have become convinced of. So when he grew up, verse 15, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. When he grew up, he understand the Scriptures. And then there was a time that he became convinced of them. Verse 14, that distinction there, you have learned and have been convinced of. So there's a time of teaching our kids what the Bible says. 
then there's a time that they have to become convinced of themselves, right? They have to examine the claims of Christ uh, for themselves. They have to uh, be subjective about it and, and see the value in Christ themselves. And this takes work. It takes effort. It takes some spiritual sweat. But this is God's plan for the parents is to disciple their children. So the question is, how do we get there? How do we get like Timothy's mom who taught the scriptures and then convinced Timothy of it? Or, or at least Timothy was convinced on his own. How do we get there? Well, we are supposed to be making disciples of our kids. The Bible has a lot to say on parenting and discipleship. And uh, I want to share with you a couple points of how this pertains to us today. Number one, as we just talked about, teach your children about the power of indwelling sin. Teach your children about the power of indwelling sin. Their sinful heart is going to set them on a trajectory that without correction, without intervention of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, will lead them to love evil and to harbor idolatry. Teach them about the power of indwelling sin. We all have a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde living inside of us. So do our kids. We have a tendency to say one thing and do another. We We want to live holy. We want to live uh, Christ's life, but we struggle with our own love for sin by nature. You can shelter your kids from each and every bad influence, but the worst and most supremely negative force in their own life is their own heart and mind that loves sin and has a tendency to love it more than anything else. When we understand the power of indwelling sin, It changes our perspective when our child misbehaves. This means you have to look at it as a natural process. Your child is going to sin. And so when they do, it shouldn't be such a surprise. But it's an opportunity. An opportunity to continue discipling your kid. Uh, Chap Betis in his book, The Disciple Making Parent, writes the following. He says, when I understand the power of indwelling sin then number one, I will not be shocked or overreact when my child sins. I will expect my child to sin. Number two, I will not expect that isolation from all bad influences will save him from sin. Rather, I will remember that their enemy is in them. That is their sinful heart. Number three, I will realize that my well-behaved child is probably wrestling with sin or the flesh, and it just may be hidden for a moment. Fourthly, I will not be defensive when someone tells me about sin in my child. In fact, I will rejoice that this sin is coming out in an early age so that I can talk with him or her. Do you think you could do that? you think you could get there with your kid? Rejoice when sin comes out because you get a chance to follow up with them and continue to disciple them. That's what it means to accept the problems that come with the responsibility of discipling. They're they're worth it. And so if you have to change your perspective in order to disciple them, that headache is something that you look forward to. You accept it. You care about that. Fifthly, I will talk with my children about the pulls of the flesh. Walking in the light does not mean that we never sin. It means that when we do sin, we bring it into the light of day by telling someone else. Six, I will cultivate a relationship with my children in which they can confess their sin to me in an atmosphere of acceptance. I will ask them hard questions knowing that the flesh desires to hide in darkness. I will seek to set up safeguards where there is a pull toward secret sin, especially on the internet since I know the flesh is so strong. My child and I will join forces in defeating the flesh in our lives. We are brothers and sisters together against a common enemy, their flesh and mine. Since we know that sin can harden and deceive the heart, Hebrews 3.13, we will not treat any sin as a small thing. It is possible to go backwards spiritually. That's another one of those hard things that we have to take upon ourselves. 
seeing sin as a big deal, even if it's just a little bit of sin. It's possible to go backwards spiritually. When we are aware of the battle of indwelling sin, we will also become aware of the power of the Holy Spirit in helping each of us put it to death. And lastly, I will not let my guard down knowing the flesh will be my enemy and my child's enemy until death. That is where our focus needs to be, on the power of indwelling sin. So this sinful pull that your kids have is their enemy as well as yours. And to sweep it under a rug or pull the wool over it and say it's not that big of a deal, just do your best, uh, that doesn't really cut the mustard. We have to teach our kids and know ourselves about the power of indwelling sin. Number two, pursue holiness in a home of grace. Pursue holiness in a home of grace. Do you think you can do that? Take, take grace, which is the only way to combat sin, which is what Christ showed us on the cross, grace upon grace, and use it as a tool to draw your children to Christ. Pursue holiness in a home of grace. My wife and I have a rule that we follow. And that is when a child brings to us something that they did wrong, that is if they confess to something before we find out, the punishment is always way less than if we found out and confronted them. So if we find out about uh, some mistake or some problem, they did something wrong, they disobeyed, uh, they, they get punished for that. But if they bring it to us and they confess it and they're honest about it, they've learned their lesson, then the punishment is way less. And isn't that what you want? You want your kids to learn the lesson. Uh, you don't just want your anger to, to come out and be satiated by throwing a temper tantrum to your kids, right? You want them to learn the lesson. So if they're learning the lesson and they bring that to you, uh, if they bring that to us in our home, we have a rule that uh, the punishment for that, there might still be consequences, but it's way less than it would be otherwise if we found out. Because the goal of parenting is focusing on the heart of the child and not just perfect behavior. Uh, one of the things that really challenged me with this, we were, my wife and I were at a, dis discipling our, uh, we're at a family conference last month, and the theme was discipling our kids, and it's where I got a lot of uh, this information. But uh, one thing that really struck out to me was this idea of when your kid disobeys you, are you more concerned that they violated your rules, or are you more concerned that they're being rebellious against God? In other words, is your focus on their relationship with God, or is your focus simply on the fact that they disobeyed your rule. If you only focus on dis that they disobey your rule, and by the way, this spoke volumes to me, because I tend to get really upset when one of my kids uh, violates my, my commands that I very clearly told them, and I said it in such a way that they would understand no matter what age they are, right? Like I very clearly laid it out, then they completely forgot about it, didn't pay attention, they violated my rules, my natural reaction is to what? My natural reaction is to get angry and then use that anger to scare them into never doing that again, right? That's just how I naturally think. That's the natural way I parent. But when I'm more concerned that this child is rebelling in their heart against God because the Bible clearly says children obey your parents and that's a part of it when you're parent gives you a very direct, easy to understand instruction, and you just say no. That's not just rebellion against the parent, it's rebellion against God, right? So am I more concerned that my child has violated their, uh, the law against God in obeying their parent, or am I more concerned that they violated my law? And this I've been really challenged with. And I think that our proper focus needs to be on that our, our kids are rebelling in their heart against their relationship with God when they break the rules, when they sin, when they, when they get in trouble, when they know better. If you only focus on how your kids violated your rules, 
your reaction is going to be anger. But if you're more focused on how your children broke God's rules, your reaction is going to be instruction. Your reaction is going to be teaching. Your reaction is going to be discipleship. And that's the goal of raising godly children. That is to disciple our kids. So focus not just on how you feel when your kids break that rule, but focus on what's happening between your child and God when they break, uh, when, when they sin against God or break the rules of the home. And when sin comes to light, talk about it in the context that Jesus took that sin from them. There may still be consequences, but God uh, has forgiven them, so therefore it's in, it, it, it implies that the the Christian parent should forgive them as well. There may still be consequences, but the guilt is, on, is gone. It's on Christ. Parents need to model grace by talking to their children about their own sin. And even, and this is a difficult one, a hard pill to swallow, even apologizing to their children when they are wrong and relating to them and even confess their own sin that they, uh, that they sinned in front of their child to, to them. This is easy to see in the light of anger. Uh, anger is one of those things that, that we get carried away with. Uh, somebody, somebody hurts you and you just want to give it back to them. And once in a while we tend to do that. We sin most against the people in our home. Uh, we, we tend to, to blow up in anger because... Our thinking has been violated, our, our rules have been violated, our philosophy of how they should act has been violated. So we tend to react in the flesh, and when we do that, parents, there's an opportunity, if you did go too far, which does happen from time to time, to go back later and talk to your kid about that. And what that does is, is it models grace, it models re- repentance, it models confession, to our kids. And this is something I try to take seriously. Uh, just last week, uh, one of my kids, uh, they, they, they didn't really do anything wrong, but they had a friend that, that did something that I considered completely inappropriate. And I, was, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and I just was having a bad day, a bad morning. I had to leave like right away. I didn't do my devotions that morning. My, my, uh, uh, my, my thoughts weren't where they should be. And so I just blew up. I, I reacted in the flesh. I yelled and I, I said, you know, I can't believe how you would accept this in your life. And why don't you do something? Why don't you stand up and say something? And then, uh, when, and then later on, when I cooled down, I looked back at the situation. And I, I thought more uh, realistically about it and how it was, it was just a one child misbehavior. My, my child, they can't control them. And, and not saying anything is not the same as condoning that behavior. So I, so I texted that child, and I said I was sorry that I, I think I overreacted. And then later when I uh, was with them in the car, we stopped and bought, I think we bought McDonald's or something. And it was just to point out the fact that I messed up, but I don't want our relationship to, to suffer the consequences of my mistakes. So please uh, understand that I'm trying here, uh, that, I, that I'm just a sinner like you or like anybody else. And what that does, I hope, my goal in that is not just to be right with them and right with the Lord, but my goal in that is to model uh, grace and to model confession, model repentance, and treat my kid how I would want them to behave when they uh, sin as well. I think anger really is a ticket, because uh, we're, we're going to be angry whether you like it or not. You're going to mess up in that area. Uh, the nature of parenting alone causes so many stressors and problems and temptations. It's almost impossible not to overreact from time to time. But anger is, is a ticket to teaching our children about grace and about confession. You, you, get, you lose your head. You go back later. You apologize. Say, let's not, try not to let this happen again. I'm going to do my part. You do your part. And that's a way to model, a, a model grace in your home. Pursue holiness in a home of grace. It may take some humility. It may take some spiritual sweat. It may take some effort. But it's worth it because our kids are worth it. Our kids are so worth it. 
Number three, focus your attention on their hearts and not just their behavior. This is very important. Why do your kids act the way they do? Why do people act the way they do? It's because it is an overflow of their heart. It's like, I've heard it explained like somebody holding a, a, a cup of coffee. Uh, when someone bumps them, the coffee spills. Uh, when you get bumped in life, whatever is inside of you is going to spill out. When disaster comes, when stresses come, whatever is inside of you is going to come out. The way you behave flows out of the heart. So watch the character of your children intercede when something is faulty. Praise them for what is good. Share scripture. Teach grace and repentance to your kids. Uh, by the way, in order to properly do that, we have to uh, focus on our heart ourselves. Look at James chapter 4. You have your Bibles open there still to James chapter 4. Clearly says that problems, stresses, fighting comes from the heart. It comes from the character of the person. James chapter 4 verse 1 says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your member? Why do you fight? Why do you have uh, all these fights with your kids? It's because your hearts are very different. There's a desire inside of you, in your members, for pleasure, to have your way, for respect, for whatever it is. And that's where wars and fights come from among us, it says. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war inside of you? It's referring to the heart and the mind of the person. Verse 2, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. In other words, in other words the covetousness, the, 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 the lusting, the murdering, which is just another word for hatred, uh, exists inside of us because we desire these things so much. Verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. You, you're looking out for number one, the, co the lustfulness of your heart, the covetousness of your heart is what you, what you want the most. And it even affects our prayer life. We pray to God for things that uh, we can spend wrongly on our own desires. Verse 4, he says, Adulterers and adulteresses do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. When he uses the word adultery, he's talking about spiritual adultery, which is idolatry, worshiping something that you shouldn't, worshiping something other than God. Instead of worshiping God, we're worshiping this thing that we covet, this desire, this need for respect, this need for glory. Whatever the case may be, whatever causes fights between you and other people, that's an idol to you. And it could be something simple like, uh, like basketball. You really want to play basketball uh, because you want the glory, you want the respect, you want the admiration of other people. Uh, and, and so that when, when that thing becomes an ultimate thing, it becomes an idol. When that's something that you want more than God or more than being right or or more than not sinning in your relationship with somebody, uh, that becomes an, an idol. So in verse 4, he calls that uh, uh, adultery. Adulterers and adulteresses do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. That means it makes you an enemy with God when you love these things more than you love God. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously. God is jealous for our worship. It's not a defect in God. That's a, that's a positive thing. He wants it first and foremost. He deserves it. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And it's in the context of spiritual idolatry, in the context of coveting what helps to uh, end that sort of sinful uh, coveting is humility. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we have to focus on their heart. We have to be 
uh, concerned about the desires inside them. Which ones are based upon the power of indwelling sin? Which ones are good? Which ones can be used for the Lord? Focus yourself on the desires, the heart of your kids, and that is going to uh, set the trajectory of their behavior. And a big part of focusing on their heart is focusing on your relationship with your kids. Uh, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to, to say don't do that. It's a whole other thing to say I wish you wouldn't do that. And since you value my relationship with you, please take that seriously. Uh, we have to be able to connect with our kids. Uh, James 1.9, if you're in James 4, flip over to James 1.9. This is a verse that is not specifically in the context of parenting, but I think it applies uh, a lot to parenting. Uh, James 1.19, I'm sorry. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Does that describe your relationship with your kids? Quick to listen, slow to speak. When you're, you, you imagine this, when your child was, was four or five years old, they come up to you with something silly like a rubber duck or a little toy, and they tell you all about it. And what's your reaction? Is your reaction really, well, you know, that rubber duck's not going to take you anywhere in life, so why don't you put it away and here's some money. Go play with that, right? You don't do that. What you do when your child brings you a toy is you listen. They're going to tell you all about the toy and the adventures that the duck went on and blah, blah. And you're like, yeah, okay, right? We all can relate to that. A kid brings you a toy phone. What do you do? What do you do? You answer the phone. You say hello, right? And you interact. But when they get older and they start talking to you about what interests them that does not interest you, I mean, think of what kids are into uh, these days, music and Marvel and, uh, you know, all sorts of strange stuff. Maybe try taking an interest in it. Uh, what, what do you like about that? What do you find it so fascinating? If it's not sinful... It's a way to connect with your children, just like that, that rubber duck or that toy phone. You take a few minutes and you learn what, what so fascinates your kids. And when you do this, when you connect with your child on a level that they feel, they will listen to you when you tell them about their sinful hearts or the, or, or your, the concerns that you have over their behavior because they, it's based upon a real relationship. I can't tell you the amount of silly stuff that I have waded through. Uh, anime. You ever watch anime? Anime is this loud, obnoxious Japanese cartoon. I have watched more than I care to admit anime with my child just to connect with this child. I'm not going to tell you who it was. But I want to connect. I don't have a lot of things that I am really uh, really can relate to this one child. So when this child says, hey, listen to this neat story that happened in this cartoon, okay, let's watch it together. What do you find so fascinating about it? I have another child that, that likes music, that's uh, in, into music, and we're, you know, we're strict about you can't listen to certain music if it has any bad words or uh, inappropriate themes, you can't listen to that, but Tell me what you're listening to, and I'll tell you what I, what I like to listen to. I, I enjoy connecting with them on that level because then when crisis happens or when sin takes place and I need them to listen to me, we have built a relationship. I hope that they would uh, adhere to my instruction over because they know it comes from a place of love. You think about what God did to win your heart. What is the thing that truly won your heart to Jesus? When you became a Christian, what is the one permeating thought that made you give your life surrendering it to Christ? What really won you to him? Was it not the kindness and love and grace of God? Right? You were smitten by his grace, his kindness towards you. And that's what led to your good behavior. So what should be the tool that we use to disciple our kids, to, to raise our kids? It should be that same grace and love that's found in Jesus Christ. It won your heart 
it will win your child's heart. Do you believe that? And again, if you're not a parent, but you're influential in other people, that's how you win their heart. Acts of love, acts of grace, acts of service. It won you to the Lord. It wins others to the Lord. It's the grace that does these things. Not the anger of man. The, righteous, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Not philosophy and, and your great intelligence. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care, right? It's grace that wins us to the Lord. It's grace that will win your kids to the Lord. It's grace that will win your neighbors to the Lord. Last thought before we close. I don't know what your relationship looks like today with your kids or with other people in your family. I know that God has put you into a family specifically for the purpose of your holiness and theirs. But your relationship with kids might be strained. Your relationship with your parents might be strained. Imagine the reconciliation that will take place when you see each other in heaven for the first time. How concerned, if you're saved and the, that, that other person is saved, how concerned are they going to be about reconciliation when they first see you for the first time in glory? They're going to be a thousand percent interested in reconciliation, aren't they? They're going to be so excited that God has made everything perfect. That one day when you see them, whether you go first or they go first, you are going to be perfectly reconciled because of the cross. And that is what we focus on today. We are we serving a God who is concerned about our reconciliation so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for sin. And he sets everything aright when we follow him. There's a great deal of hope in Christ. When we focus ourselves and we humble ourselves and we pursue grace, pursue love, there is so much hope that can be done. It takes work. It takes effort. But this is why God put us on this planet. We're saved for good works, which God prepared uh, in advance for us to do. This is the reason why we live, is to bring reconciliation and to, to share the gospel with people and to follow after Christ. He is a good God. He knows exactly what he's doing. Let's trust him today with our kids and with our ministries. Let's pray. Lord, uh, a lot of these things that we talked about today are very heavy and require a great deal of attention. Lord, sometimes we are overwhelmed with, I don't know how I can keep doing this. I don't know how I can keep giving of myself. Lord, help us to focus on you this morning. Focus on Christ who has given all of himself to us without holding anything back. And communicate it, communicated that truth in a thousand pages in the Bible. Lord, I pray that we could be like you today. Focusing on the reconciliation in our relationships, focusing on the disciple making of our children and of, uh, of other people that you give us influence to disciple. Focusing ourselves on our personal obedience to Christ, not holding back anything. Lord, as we read this morning, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Lord, humble us. Help us to accept our role Accept the problems that discipling people brings and even enjoy those problems because they're wor it's worth it to deal with them head on because the other person is worth it. Our kids are worth it because Christ is worth it. And I pray that you would just renew our hearts and mind with conviction to disciple those that you give us influence in. Lord, thank you for those who have poured into us Pray, God, that we can pour into others as well. In your son's name. Uh, by the way, if you are uh, interested in this book,